Have you ever felt like quitting? Maybe it's a job and you are done. And you're, you don't, you're, you're to the point you don't even give you two weeks. You're just like, peace out. I'm, I'm over this. I'm, I'm gone. Uh, maybe it's your home life. You are done. Maybe your marriage has just been barely hanging on for a while and you're ready to, to, to go. You're, you're ready to step, step away from this and call it quits. Maybe it's your schedule. Your schedule is so busy, so full, you are ready to let something off of your calendar because you just can't take anymore. Or maybe it's just life in general. Maybe you're just over life in general and people, you just, you're, you, you've, you've had it with people. What are you needing to throw the towel in or wanting to throw the towel in right now on? You see, we've all been there. And to some extent, we've all given up on something at some point in our lives. And what happens is we hit that point where the frustration doesn't seem to be worth the effort we're investing in it anymore. And when you get to that point, something's got to change. And usually when you get to the point of something needing to change, you have a source of pain in your life that's just not going away, no matter how hard you try. And all of us have different pain tolerances. Now, I'm not just talking about physical pain. I'm talking about emotional pain, mental pain, spiritual pain. And we all have our threshold that we hit. And when we steadily exceed that threshold, that's when we want to quit. Because we want to bring an end to the pain that we feel. And right or wrong, that's just human nature. That's how we go about things. <coughs> now, <clears throat> this year, I, I complete my 11th year in ministry as, as a pastor. I've been in ministry for about 17 years. But as a pastor, uh, I'm hitting 11 and there have been more than one occasion when I've looked at my wife and said, I'm sitting down on my computer and I'm writing my resignation letter to the bishop because I'm, I'm done. I've hit that point. The ministry has just gotten too draining. The drama has gotten too dramatic. The complaints have gotten too loud. And the work is just, it has sucked the life out of me and I've had it. Now, every time she's studied my hand and she's talked me off that ledge, but there's not a single pastor that I know that hasn't hit that point. I'm convinced you all have hit those points in your life, whatever the context as well. We've all been there. You know, what happens is when you get to the point of needing change, you're willing to do whatever it takes because you've had it and you need something to give. Well, while moving on sometimes is the best course of action, not always. You know what I've discovered in my own situation? And I think it's true for yours as well. I have survived all of my worst days. You have survived all of your worst days too. Despite how we feel about a situation, and our feelings are fickle. That's why you can't always trust them. Eat a bad burrito, you're going to feel bad, right? You can't always trust your feelings. So despite how you feel, we got to acknowledge that by God's grace, if you woke up this morning, yesterday is now in the past. And however you felt yesterday, it's now in the past. You see... David, in the Old Testament, he understood this concept. He wrote about it in Psalm chapter 30. He says this, sing the praises of the Lord, you, his faithful people. Praise his holy name for his anger lasts only for a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. It's actually from this passage, we get the phrase joy comes in the morning. And David gets it. Man, if you read David's life, he went through all kinds of difficult situations. Exterior to him, interior to him, massive family rifts that play out in the front of all of the people. Like he has gone through difficulties. He gets it that life is hard sometimes. And the burdens that we carry, they often seem the heaviest at night. How many of us have gone to sleep with tears in our eyes because the day was so difficult? 
but he says, because he knows his experience with the faithfulness of God is that joy comes in the morning. A new day arrives every day. And by the grace of God, we get to reset. So we are in the season of Lent, which Lent, Lent is the 40 days that leads up to Easter morning. But this rhythm of Lent to Easter, it involves the idea that life gets harder before you get to the resurrection. Something has to die in order for you to experience newness of life. Now, all throughout Lent, I have asked that you take a specific thing in your life that you need to see change in, that you can't bring yourself and to bring that specific request to God and let him work and to trust him over the course of these 40 days that by the end of it, your situation is going to look different because God has moved. Either God has moved you or God has moved your situation. But in the process, you're left waiting. And some of us enter here this morning on the edge. Marriage is hanging on by, the, by a thread. Our work life, we are, you're, we're ready to tell our boss that we're done. We may be feeling helpless, lost, and alone right now. You may feel like you're on the verge of crazy. And the verge was a few days ago. Now I'm quoting from, we're following a Lenten devotional right now. I'm quoting from day 17, which will be tomorrow's devotional. The author says, we all get discouraged from time to time. You think? For some of us, that's an overstatement. Yet in the discouragement of waiting for God to move, we've got to learn to pray. We've got to learn to be thankful for the little things. We have to learn to worship. So for me, it started in uh, 2021. It kind of really came into culmination in 2022 as our denomination was splitting. And uh, as that was happening, I'm just, I'm carrying so much stress because I don't know what's going to happen to me. I don't know what's going to happen with the church. I don't know what to do. I'm trusting God, but it, it's stressful. And so in my stress, I turned to nostalgia to kind of alleviate that stress. If you've heard me preach for any period of time, you know I am a collector. And as I've gotten stressed, I've turned to collecting things from my childhood. Things that bring back that nostalgia feeling. So like vintage Star Wars and G.I. Joes and video games from the 80s and 90s, I've, I've learned to collect. Because I, I look at that and go, oh yeah, that's a positive memory from my childhood past. Or I was never allowed to have that, so I'm going to get it now. And... Um, <laughs> What has happened, especially last year, as my collection has grown, I've learned that, all right, I'll start buying and reselling. I'll connect people with their childhood past, and this works out for everybody. And uh, in the process of that, I, I have turned my dial to the 80 station here in Houston. We've got a great 80 station, and I'm convinced 80s, best decade of music. Amen? <laughs> Y'all were supposed to be my people. The last group said that too. They were like, no, no. What decade is it for you? 70s. 70s, 70s has got great hits too. I'm not going to lie. I actually, as I was looking over this, I went back to a few of the songs that I turned to. I'm like, oh no, those are from the 70s. Okay. Um, but you know, nothing beats. I didn't hear that. Uh, Nothing beats driving around Houston on a blue sky day, you know, you out driving around, you got the 80s music, like the, just the vibes you get from that. Those are good feelings. Those are good days. But what I've realized is that when life looks bleak, and some days life looks bleak, aha, Duran Duran, Rick Springfield, Bruce Springsteen, not even Journey hit the spot. Because it's in those moments, I need to worship. Friends, when life hits hard, you may wanna change what's coming out of the speaker, what you got in your earbuds. Because what you listen to will dictate your mood. And when you change it to worship, it makes all the difference in the world. In fact, Acts talks about what happens when you do the, it says, it talks about Acts chapter 16, the apostle Paul, 
He's on this missionary journey. He's going around telling people about Jesus around the Mediterranean Sea. And he's with his buddy Silas and they're in a city and they find themselves in a world of trouble. Acts 16, starting verse 22, it says, The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. So let me give you the backstory. They're in a city, they are preaching and they come across this young girl who is a slave and she is possessed by a demon. Now, I don't pretend to quite understand how all this works, but scripture says that because she was possessed, she was able to predict to at least to some extent future events. And that made a lot of money for her owners. People would pay to have her read their fortune. Well, Paul and Silas, they come up, they see this girl possessed. They cast this demon out in the name of Jesus, setting her free, but eliminating the prophets, the future prophets, of her owners. Now I have figured this out and Paul and Silas figured this out in a big way that when you mess with people's money, they get cruel. And so these, these businessmen start leading an attack against Paul and Silas. They whip up the crowd to be on their side who literally physically attacks them. And so Paul and Silas go from liberating a child to being stripped naked, beaten with rods, shackled and thrown in a prison awaiting their fate. If they were thinking about quitting the ministry, that would have been a good day to do it. Yet what do you do when life looks bleak and you need God to move? You pray, you worship. Verse 25, it says about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all of the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. You know, it's a good story, but what happened? Where, where was God when they were being beaten? Where was God when they were stripped naked? Where was God when they were shackled? Where was God when they were thrown into the jail cell? And notice it said they didn't get the, the jail cell on the exterior of the jail where they have a nice little window and can see out. No, they get thrown into the inner part of the jail, the dungeon where it is pitch black. Where was God in the midst of their hardship? That's a question that we often ask too. Where is God when life gets hard? Because life gets hard. Let me help you understand something. And this may reframe some things for you. But the purpose of God's relationship with us is not to help us avoid pain. You see, pain is necessary. We don't like it. And we try to mask it. We try to cover it up. We try to numb ourselves from it all of the time. Yet pain is a fundamental part of the human experience. It's how we learn. It's how we grow. God never said he came to rescue you from all of your pain. Yet he promises to meet you in the midst of it. Some of you have been praying and some of you have been praying this for a long time for God to remove the pain in your life. And I'm not just talking physical pain. I mean, there is healing that God brings. I get that. But some of us have been praying for God to just keep us from any and all pain, emotional pain, mental pain, spiritual pain. And it hasn't gone away. And you think God has failed you, but friends, God has not failed you. Perhaps we are just praying the wrong prayers. And see, you see, instead of asking God to remove or to avoid pain in your life for you altogether. May we start praying that God meets us in our pain and helps us heal through it. See, Paul and Silas, they're nursing their wounds. It's why they're awake at midnight. They can't go to sleep, they're in so much pain. And so while they're awake, laying there in the dark, they start to pray. Did you notice they started to sing? 
They didn't have speakers, but they changed the dial. They changed the tone of the conversation. They set the tone for all of the other prisoners who could hear them. And they began to worship God. You see, Paul and Silas understood that their situation was pretty bad. But just because their situation was bad, it didn't make God bad. And so they worshiped. And when they worshiped, God showed up. Acts 16 says God sent some kind of an earthquake that, sh that rattled the jail cell doors open and loosened the chains that they were bound by. I mean, they basically, they got a jailbreak. Get out of jail free. Now, some of you need God to shake up your circumstances too. So friends, get to praying. Get to worshiping. Yet notice, God didn't take away their pain immediately. Instead, he set them free. Before we can get to the point of healing, so often we have to be set free from whatever it is that has oppressed us. And so some of you need to pray for freedom in your life before you pray for anything else. But look what happens next. Verse 27, it says, the jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourselves. We're all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At the hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all of his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. So the jailer wakes up to, the, to this earthquake that rattles the jail. He sees the doors are flung open and immediately he pulls out his sword because he's going to take his own life out of the shame of losing all of these prisoners. But Paul calls out from the dark. Remember, they're stuck in pitch black. He calls out, hey, we're all still here. You can lower the sword. Everybody play calm. And the jailer is so moved by what has happened. He goes to Paul and Silas and he says, okay. What do I have to do to be saved? Because clearly the God that you were preaching about that landed you in jail, he did this and I went in. And so they tell him about Jesus and that all he has to do is place his faith in Jesus and he and his household will be saved. The jailer takes the prisoners that, is, that are entrusted to his care and he brings them home because he wants his family to hear about Jesus too. He cooks them a meal, he tends to their wounds and it, the scripture says the whole household got baptized that night. But notice, God didn't heal Paul and Silas from their prayers and worship. Their prayers and worship led to their freedom However, it was the person God had them encounter in the middle of their pain who tended to their wounds. I need you to see this. Friends, the hardships you face will lead you to encounter people you wouldn't otherwise encounter because God needs you to play a part in their story and he needs them to play a part in your story. You don't live in a vacuum. God is working as much in the person's life sitting next to you as he is working in yours. And so when you feel like God isn't moving fast enough in your life, perhaps it's because God is working in their story and it's not time to alleviate you of your situation just yet. But God used the jailer whom they would have never encountered apart from this, to be the one to bring their healing. And God used them in the midst of their pain to witness to the jailer and his whole family was saved. But friends, it comes down to learning to pray 
when you are in the bleakest of nights. You've got to learn to worship when things turn so bad. Because weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. Friends, don't give up at midnight because you'll miss how God moves at daybreak. So I invite you to keep bringing that specific request that you need God to change in your life. Keep bringing that to him over the course of this Lenten season. Keep asking God, Lord, move or move me. Move the situation or move me in the midst of the situation. But don't just pray for the avoidance of pain. I know that's a temptation. We all want to pray. God, just keep me from all trouble and hardship and any issues. Instead, pray for God to meet you in the midst of your situation so that he can change the situation. Because in life, there is the promise of pain. Yet God promises to be your help along the way. But to try to avoid pain, to try to mask our pain, to try to cover it, to try to numb out from it is to avoid the main catalyst for life. But to have God show up in your situation, that's one of the highlights of a life worth living.